time we saw that the crucial move in Christianity is the, I, the development of the idea of guilt before God. So that there is a debt to God that literally can never be repaid. So that we are always continuously guilty. And so this is the creation of a kind of reactive feeling, uh, a reactive feeling of inferiority and blame that's always present. And so in light of this condition, uh, we need to practice um, the virtues of morality, the virtues of the slave system of evaluation. And these are, I've alluded to these before, but these are what Hume would call the monkish virtues. So he identifies these as virtues for individuals in this sort of fallen condition. So what Hume calls the monkish virtues are celibacy, fasting, penance, mortification, self-denial, humility, silence, and solitude. So these are what a good person, uh, qualities that a good person has. Okay, so I want to, I sort of skipped this at the end last time, but I want to point out that there's nothing inevitable about the idea of gods um, being instruments of this kind of creation of guilt. There's nothing inevitable that religion must always do this. Uh, not, the other way around, not all religions think of individuals as guilty before God. Um, and in particular, the Greeks did not. So this is the contrast that Nietzsche is always interested in. Um, as he says, they didn't have um, sorry, that their gods did not involve what he calls this idea of self-crucifixion. In fact, he says, um, for the longest time, on page 64, these Greeks used their gods precisely to keep bad conscience, the persistent feeling of guilt, at arm's length, to be able to remain cheerful about their freedom of soul. That is the reverse of the use which Christianity makes made of its God. So a different way of saying this is to say that the Greeks that he's talking about here um, weren't under the spell of asceticism. They were ascetics. And in particular, you can see this, he says, um, on the bottom of, um, sorry, um, the, um, top of 65, um, he says that um, for the Greeks, when something bad happens, when somebody has done something wrong, it is a case, he says, of foolishness, not of sin. Thus the noble Greek wondered for centuries in the fact of every incomprehensible atrocity and wanton act with which one of his equals had sullied himself. He says, a god, when something horrible happens, he says, a god must have beguiled him, he said to himself finally, shaking his head. So in other words, uh, there's not a notion of free will that allows one to, to have done otherwise. There's not a notion of absolute spontaneity that somehow independent of um, our, our nature. Um, but that's not to say that we don't sometimes, on this Greek view, do wrong. There are horrible things. And in particular, I want you to notice that there is, even on this Greek view, without persistent guilt, without persistent free will, there is uh, an understanding of responsibility, and there is an idea of a certain kind of punishment. 
there is, is an idea of a debt to be extracted, a price to be paid for wrong behavior. But it's not something that generates a persistent feeling of guilt, and there's not a sense that one could have done otherwise. So think about Oedipus, for example. So Oedipus clearly did something wrong, and yet, sorry, and furthermore, there's a price to be paid for this, right? he inflicted punishment on himself, um, and yet there clearly, in this case, it clearly was not the case that he could have done otherwise. And he precisely did not will in a bad way. His maxim was perfectly fine. Um, so this idea of not having um, persistent guilt and not having uh, this sort of ascetic ideal, um, you should not confuse with nobody ever doing anything wrong or they're not being any kind of appropriate punishment. Okay, and at the very end, this is what um, we sort of left off with at the end last time. Um, Nietzsche asks himself whether um, he's um, destroying a certain ideal of values or trying to create a new one. He clearly thinks he's trying to create a new one. He's absolutely not a nihilist. He points out that the only way to create and establish a new system of values is to destroy the old one. But he's worried about this. This is something that um, concerns him greatly. After all, the moral system of values, as I've been pointing out all along here, has created things, historically, of great value. Um, it has been, morality has been productive, but in a sense, he would say, moral values, mm, well, in a sense, moral values have outlived their usefulness. They're no longer productive for us now today. But their having lived, outlived their usefulness is not because of some external change. Nietzsche thinks that what the moral system of values has done, what the aesthetic ideal has done, in fact, is develop in a way that actually undermines itself. It's developed in a way to undercut its own affirmations, the things that it takes to be valuable. And therefore, what we're what the, the condition that we find ourselves in today is one in which uh, a collapse of denialism really is a threat, is a genuine threat. Because for the last, what, two millennia, uh, the system of values and affirmations that's guided us and has um, led us to, in fact, create things of value, now has undermined itself. And so um, it's no longer something that we can affirm in good conscience, he thinks. Uh, so this is what he's saying. Um, the bottom is 65. This is, uh, so this is line 27. It says, for all too long, man has regarded his natural inclinations with an evil eye, so that in him they have finally become wedded to bad conscience, to guilt. And so we feel guilty about our natural instincts and natural a reverse attempt would in itself be possible, he says. So reversing what uh, we take to be, what, what we feel guilty about. Uh, it would be possible, but who's strong enough for it? Namely, here's what a reversal would be. To wed to bad conscience the unnatural inclinations. All those aspirations to the beyond, to that which is contrary to the senses. Contrary to the instincts, contrary to nature, contrary to the animal. What's the beyond that he's talking about here? And beyond what? <coughs> so, let's say it again. Uh, the reversal that he's calling for would be to attach this feeling of 
bad conscience of rejecting, not to our natural instincts, but to all of the instincts and drives to the <coughs> beyond. What does that mean? Yeah, sure. So he's saying, um, for too long, like the condition that we're in now, we've regarded our natural in inclinations with uh, the idea of a bad conscience. We feel guilty about our natural instincts and drives under the moral system of values. But what we could do, if someone were strong enough to do this, we were strong enough, what we could in theory do is reverse this. So wed to bad conscience, not our natural inclinations, but what he's calling here our unnatural inclinations, all those aspirations to the beyond, so rejecting those things, uh, to that which is contrary to the senses, contrary to the instincts, contrary to nature, contrary to the animal. What is that? What are those? All those like monkish ideals? That you're sure, about. but how's this so beyond what? Morals? So, what are those monkish ideals again? Like self crucifixion, I think you said. Like right. basically restricting yourself in this life so you can have a better next life. The next life, exactly. That's what's beyond. So, the ideal of. So, the. The moral ideal here, the ascetic ideal, is to reject our embodied physical existence here. To say that that is evil. That, that is something that we have to reject. And reject it in favor of, well, our non-embodied, non-physical, non-material existence our eternal soul, which is going to go on beyond our life here on earth. And that's what's really important, so says Christianity, so says the moral system of values, so says asceticism. But this is what Nietzsche is calling for a reversal, rejecting the, you would say, false idea of a non-material spirit that will live on, that will go to heaven, and that's where true value is to be found. Rejecting that, feeling almost guilty about imagining that because it's false. And instead, finding affirmation here on earth. <coughs> Namely, to wed, here's the reversal, to re bad conscience, the unnatural inclinations, all those aspirations to the beyond, to that which is contrary to the senses, contrary to the in instincts, contrary to nature, contrary to the animal, to our physical body. In short, the previous ideals, which are all ideals hostile to life, ideals, ideals of those who libel the world. To, uh, he says, to whom to turn today with those kinds of hopes and demands. Um, in so doing, in order to effect that kind of reversal, uh, one would have precisely the good human beings against oneself. So this the good, like, as morality understands it. Um, well, so you already saw him say, Who's strong enough to bring this kind of change about? Um, and the answer is maybe no one. It might not be possible to bring this about. And that's why a threatened collapse into nihilism is a real possibility. This is why we're on the brink of a disaster. Line 14. Fourteen on page 66. But someday, in a stronger time than this decaying, self-doubting present, he really must come to us, the redeeming human of the great love and contempt, the creative spirit whose compelling strength again and again drives him out of any part or beyond 